we're just so disconnected with our bodies and, Mm -hmm. you know, our bodies, like patients will come in and they'll be like, I threw out my back. I didn't do anything. I was just picking up my shoe or something. And it's like, well, you know, what was happening in the months before, like your body was trying to tell you something. You might not have been able to hear it, but it was trying to. And eventually the, the whisper gets louder and louder until it literally like smacks you on your, on your butt. Did you know that we each lose a different amount of electrolytes in our sweat, largely based on our genetics? That means that there's no one size fits all perfect sports drink for everybody because we each have unique needs. That's why we at Solpre developed the Sync Hydration System, a series of sports drinks to help match you with the personal level of electrolytes that you need. If you'd like us to help you match with your perfect sports drink, go to solpre.com slash hydration dash quiz. That's solpre.com slash hydration dash quiz. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is a runner. She's gotten into mountain biking after she's made a move uh, across the border, which I'm definitely going to ask her about. Um, She is a doctor of chiropractic with a focus in pre and postnatal care. Um, She's also developed an online resource for postnatal moms to get back into running, um, which is not something I would ever experience being man, but I know running is, you know, almost part of my soul at this point. So if that is you, um, you've had a baby, you want to get back into running, um, stay around with this episode, maybe check down in the description. We'll probably have a link to that for you to check out. Um, So welcome to the show, Dr. Alyssa Salava. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for spending time with me mm-hmm. uh, and sitting through the intro. I know I kind of get wordy sometimes and you're uh, eagerly awaiting to actually be able to say anything. Um, mm-hmm. But oh, so- the one thing I want to add, so I do pre and postnatal, but also babies and okay. kids. That's all. <laughs> no, yeah, no, perfectly fine. Um, so the first thing I, I just got to give you a little bit of a hard time because you grew up in the U.S. So and then moved to Canada. You left us. I know. Um, you've you've crossed the border, uh, and, and I just have to ask you why? Why? Like, why did you abandon us uh, for quote unquote greener pastures? <laughs> um, so I'm from Minnesota, and I went to chiropractic school in Portland, Oregon, and I met a Canadian boy in chiropractic oh, school. Okay. <laughs> it's one of those stories. Um, and we practiced in Bend, Oregon for a few years, and uh, we just wanted to explore somewhere else, and Squamish um, was just always a place that I found really fascinating. I ran, um, at that time, it was just the Squamish 23K, but I was, like, obsessed with the thought of running the 50-50, which I have done now, Um, and we just, yeah, we wanted to make Squamish happen. And a couple of years later, here we are. (laughs) I know that the uh, immigration process isn't always the smoothest thing to get into Canada and become a resident. I guess I don't know if you're on track to to do dual citizenship or whether. Yeah, so I am common law with my partner and um, like, I'm super fortunate that my application process was easy peasy like I started it and like within six months I like got approved and I actually like I got my letter on American Thanksgiving so like you know like a month or two before COVID hit and like had I waited any longer like it could have taken years to get in because they were so backed up so yeah I was really lucky yeah so good timing on your part to (laughs) to get it all sorted out get crossed so, well, which, you know, it's hindsight, right? Because at the time forward looking, you're not like, well, oh, we're going to have a pandemic here in a couple of months. I better like get a move on. It's just, you know, that's how life works out, which is kind of nice sometimes. Yeah, definitely. So um, you know, maybe this is not interesting to the listener. It's a curiosity of mine though. So I know like, um, you know, Canada will not recruit, but like 
give preference to like skilled workers coming into the country because they don't want you to just come in and be a bum and not you know produce for the economy. Uh, that's part of the immigration process. So what, is it difficult like with the credentialing since you know credentials start in the U.S. and is it did they make an easy transfer to oh, Canada? Yeah. So. Um, like you're talking about like my chiropractic correct right. credentials, right? Oh yeah. So um, I my I met my partner. He was like my first friend in school, and like you know our relationship grew, and we both took American and Canadian boards throughout mm. school because we knew that like we were together and we wanted to have options. And so, like I had already, yeah, gotten all my Canadian boards done long before like we moved here. Um, and so it was, it was super easy, but had I not done all that, I would have had to spend a lot of time studying biochemistry and microbiology and all that again. (laughs) That's just, I, it it escapes me now who I was speaking with. Um, cause I think this was several years ago on the show. Uh, but we were talking about, he is a doctor in a different country and he wanted to come to the U.S., but it was like credentials weren't going to transfer. He would basically have to start over at like year one of resident of like medical school all over again. And he'd been a practicing physician for a number of years, so it was like he was like that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I don't even think it was like I really wish I could remember who this was. I, I don't even remember him. It, it's not like it was like a small country. Like it was a well-developed nation Mm -hmm. it wasn't you know like you would think there wouldn't be any issues so that's something that just I remember having that conversation with him and that was kind of my curiosity of like is it easy um I know many things are relatively easy between the U.S. and Canada since we're neighbors as opposed to like you know across the pond neighbors yeah Uh, and luckily like you know I'm like I'm working on the body like I'm not like cutting the body open or prescribing like harsh medications like you know it's not yeah I think it would transfer pretty easily um yeah (laughs) yeah um so I think you know I know you talked about this a little bit before but for other listeners maybe that are not familiar with you uh can you talk a little bit about I mean why get into chiropractic at all like your your history and kind of what led you to that yeah um I have a very long running history and I'll just kind of give you the cliff notes um I started running in high school and I'm a very competitive person and you know with running the harder you work typically the better you get and so I was kind of in that cycle of really pushing myself and getting better and getting better. And I ended up, you know, becoming quite good in the like high school level. And I was plagued with injury after injury, I would push my body too hard. And then I would end up getting a stress fracture or whatever. Um, And so I saw lots of different providers. Um, I saw PTs or physios, we call them in Canada. I saw chiropractors, I saw medical doctors, like trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Why was I always getting injured? Um, And the, the only person that ever actually addressed like my issue was a chiropractor. He looked me straight in the eye and he's like, are you eating? Like, do you have an eating disorder? And nobody else had ever asked me and I did, um, but nobody knew about it. And so I'm like that typical, at that time it was the female athlete triad. Now it's the red S Um, Mm -hmm. that was, you know, I was that to a T and I just kind of like kept pushing my body, not fueling it enough and was injured all the time. And I saw what it was like to go through the medical system and to, you know, just be given or just be told that I need to take medication because I have low bone density or not ever run again. And all these options just never resonated with me. And it was the chiro, it was 
various chiropractors in my life that really showed me the potential of the human body and how like I can heal and you know, I need to adjust the root cause of it. And it was, you know, this imbalance in my life and all of that. And so I, w- I went to college and I ran for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, and that was also super toxic. Um, our coach also had an eating disorder and just like judged us based on like how we looked, whether we would be fast enough. And again, it just didn't resonate with me. And I knew that there was something more, but I didn't know what. And I was deciding whether I wanted to be a doctor, a physio, a chiropractor. And it just kind of kept back to all of my healing journey has been uh, like facilitated through chiropractors. And that's not to say that, you know, others you know, aren't amazing as well, but just what aligned with me most. And I became a chiropractor because I needed chiropractic and chiropractic, like, I mean, changed my life and changed just like the connection that I have with my body and like my physical and my emotional state. (laughs) It was a long... (laughs) A long, well, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's a, a long history. So I, yeah. a couple of things you had mentioned. So I, I talked to a number of, and now it is typically more prevalent for women, but there are still men with eating disorders. But um, so two episodes for you, the listener, that you might check out, um, Sarah McMahon, episode 134. Um, she's an ultra runner. Uh, she talks about her kind of struggles in getting through eating disorder and coming back to a, a stronger place and I think much like you wasn't in an environment where it was like you're judged on your looks and then also that there's this like temporary boost of performance where like you cut weight and before things get totally broken like you get this kind of bump up in performance because you've cut weight power's still there but then th- there's no nutrition so everything like breaks and just blows up and so it's this like really terrible situation um but the initial one i thought of was uh, alex coates uh, episode 111 she's actually a former canadian pro triathlete and she is uh by the time this is out she'll have finished her phd but she's doing research specifically on reds um and i know her sister as well was a canadian pro triathlete and so that's another episode to check out if that's like your kind of alley or situation but like super common I don't know how like I I think I tend to overeat as an athlete which is the opposite of most people's problems but that's because I think I I was like most people under eight in like high school got injured flat performances all these kind of things um it's so common I think more common for especially endurance athletes to undereat than it is to overeat. And I'm not sure, you know, I, I often ask people that have kind of been through the ringer for lack of a better term, you know, how do we address it? How, how do we like, like stem the, stem the flow, stem the blood flow. Like, like how do we reduce the number of people that are, I guess, subject to kind of this like toxic culture or um, these bad environments where they're ending up beat up, broken, you know, disheartened because of working so hard and getting nowhere because they've been, been or are being kind of led down a straight path. Yeah, um, I definitely <clears throat> think the first step is talking about it. Um, I've been out of undergrad now for like over 10 years. And before, you know, it wasn't something that was talked about. Like it was something that I learned about in my undergrad um, textbook, but it was like, we went over it for five minutes and then we kept going, you know, and like, I felt so isolated and like, I was the only one that was going through this. Right. Right. Um, But, you know, fast forward 10 years, you know, 
I can, I can name probably 10 people like close friends that have gone through this as well. And we just, we didn't know others were struggling. And so just being open about, about it. And I think, you know, had I known that what I was doing was, you know, I lost my period, I had low bone density, like would I have changed, you know, probably not, but at least I would have known that I was having like significant effects on my current health, but also the lifelong trajectory of my health too. And maybe like my coaches would have known about it. Maybe my parents would have like been aware of like warning signs or friends, or, you know, if, if more people just knew about it, they would maybe just like question it a bit. Um, but with my chiropractic background too, like it's so much more than just about like that time in your life, because I'm, I'm taking this course right now in learning on how to like optimize a baby's like neurodevelopment. And we are so susceptible for the first thousand days of our life on um, from conception to age two. And, you know, if you're born into a state of stress, or if there's an imbalance in like your biochemistry, like these can have lifelong effects on you. You can change them if you know what to change. And like, you can change the way that your brain is wired and how you respond to stress. But I mean, you typically don't do that in the first 17 years of your life. <laughs> it's, right. it's later on when you're like, oh, I don't actually identify with how I'm responding. I don't like having this constant set, like set point of stress and disease in my body. Um, and, you know, that's a healing journey in itself, but it's just, I really am trying to empower my preconception moms to, you know, those first few years of like really optimizing that home environment to support these babies and these kids so that, you know, they have a more balanced nervous system and can adapt more to stress when stress becomes a bigger part of their life. You know, I just, no, I, you know, I know that um, this is kind of a de developing field. Part of it is just because data collection, like longitudinal data collection takes forever. Like you have to wait, you, you can't speed it up. But, you know, trying to, trying to set your kid up for good life, I think is a, a tall task for many people. Um, I, I've spoken with many parents. I'm only a very new parent myself. Um, how old? Uh, she just is three months old just last week. <gasps> Congrats. That's amazing. So, um, but I know like when I speak with say like athlete parents, cause that's who I get to talk to, uh, mm -hmm. with the show, you know, I, especially when I speak with the Olympians, they're always just like the anti-helicopter parent, at least in our conversation. I guess I don't, I don't live with them. I don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis, but how they present themselves is like, like, I'm not going to, like, I'm going to support my kid, but I'm not going to push them to try to be, you know, the next me. Like mm -hmm. if they want it, they'll figure it out. But like, versus I think, you know, thinking about like that initial environment and then, as, as you're growing um you know parents to go like overboard they they want the best for their kids but then they'll like try too hard and like push their kids too hard like into things that they don't necessarily want to do or harder with things they want to do and you know i i wonder how much of its culture um you know because we're competitive by nature at least in the, you know the u.s and I wonder how much of it's like that kind of, I don't know, maybe internal instinct. I know I, I, like, I see my daughter and I go like, I want her to be all the things that she wants to be. Right. But you also can't like force that upon her. Like it's, it will be as she grows up to her to kind of grow and discover totally. and find and choose. 
So it, it, it's interesting, like trying to figure out how to set up, I guess, a good environment for a kid without totally. being too laid back and not being too overbearing at the same time. Yeah. And it comes down to one, you know, you being in a balanced state of safety and like love and confidence. And then you just, you know, being there for her, providing, you know, her basic needs, giving her attention, giving her love. And I mean, I think that every parent is going to, in some degree, mess up their kids. Um, but, yeah. you know, like I've said that for a long just, time, all parents screw up all children. Yeah. To, but to like, a greater I mean, or lesser degree. You just do your best. And like, your hope is that like, you just let their light shine. So this is where I, I wanted to ask you, because I saw this uh, and, and my wife and I were actually discussing this the other day. Um, Cause we're, you know, number one, I think chiropractors in general get a bad name because I think there are bad chiropractors and then it just kind of becomes a, a joke. Um, but like, I've been seeing uh, like a chiropractic person or he's a chiropractor, but like he, we mostly are working on like physical therapy kind of things. This like, that's 95% of the visit is like stretches, you know, muscle scraping. I've talked about this in other episodes um, in, in kind of a more like holistic approach to trying to get me back to full running health. Um, anyway, so my wife and I were discussing this today, the other day and going, well, why, like, why do, babies need any kind of adjustment or help or anything yeah. so you know we're obviously ignorant of the situation and it's what you specialize in so I'll give you I guess a moment yeah. to kind of stump for yourself cool so I first want to like explain to first that you know just like chiropractic you know physios massage therapists like there's quote unquote good ones and there's quote unquote bad ones um however you know the one that you had a bad experience with doesn't mean that they're bad for everybody. Right. And there is a huge span of different people's philosophies and beliefs and, you know, what resonates with them. Um, in the chiropractic, well, in just like in medicine, there's kind of like in chiropractic, there's kind of two branches. There's the mechanistic view where, you know, that's a little, it's like my knee hurts. I want you to work on my knee. Um, and then there's the vitalistic side that, you know, my knee hurts, but how's your sleep? How's your diet? Um, how's your stress? Like all of these other things. And one is not better than the other. Um, if you have a marathon to run in a week and you need your knee fixed so you can run, like you're going to do whatever you can, but you know, why is your knee hurting and what are you doing in your life? That's affecting that. And it can be a physical thing. Um, but it can also be an emotional thing. And, um, I definitely like to tap more into that vitalistic, um, that emotional side of things. Cause I've have found that I'm just a very like energetic, emotional person and that doesn't jive with everybody and that's totally fine. Um, but so, yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, and then as far as babies, why do they need, um, chiropractic? Um, so if you think about, so stress can be physical stress, it can be emotional stress, and it can be chemical stress. And we have all of these stressors surrounding us all the time, whether like we consciously know it or not. And we do things to minimize these stressors, but they're still here. Um, and it's not just the stress of that person or that baby. It's the stress of mom or the family. And um, when babies are you know, in the womb, they piggyback on mom's nervous system. And if mom is in a constant state of stress, well, that's going to be that foundation of baby's nervous system. Or if um, the labor and delivery didn't go as smoothly as planned, and, you know, maybe it was, they needed a vacuum or forceps, or it ended in an emergency C-section, the birth process is a very important 
like process for um, the neurodevelopment. It helps to prime reflexes. It helps to flourish like microbacteria, like all of these things. And if, you know, we don't have that, or if it's skewed a bit, that can already be just taking them off of their like optimal pathway. Um, it can lead to stress in their body and that can show up as feeding, breastfeeding issues. And that can show up as babies favoring, turning their head to one side over the other. And if that's left for long periods of time, baby's head shape can change. Um, it can affect their milestones. It can affect them not enjoying tummy time, not being able to roll, maybe not crawling or not crawling in that proper cross crawl, opposite arm and leg movement. And we know that movement is what allows our brain to grow. And so if they have an imbalance in their movement, we know that the wiring of their brain and their nervous system is imbalanced. And that might sound, you know, a little scary, a little far out there, but if we can, you know, have those movements be better balanced, their brain is going to be able to hear everything that's going on and be able to elicit proper responses. And that can look like, you know, later on in life, um, you're a distance runner. And every time you step, there's just muscles that are just slightly not activating or over activating a little bit. And if you do that a hundred times, not a big deal. But if you do that 10,000 times every single day for years and years, that can create tension and patterns. And then that can lead to injuries. And so my hope is that when I work with babies, I am trying to create this balanced nervous system so that their brain and their body can create the optimal connection and so that they can elicit, you know, proper motor responses and hopefully help them just be more balanced nervous system wise, but also in a biomechanical way. So that kind of brings me backwards to, um, you know, my thought about like overbearing parents. How do you, how do you decide, okay, I think maybe my baby needs help or like my baby's fine. Cause you mm -hmm. know, there's this, there is the possibility of the tendency of just being like, like I said, like trying to over-optimize where you're like, I, I need my baby to be an Olympian. So therefore I'm going to go see Alyssa and she's going to make my baby the next superstar. Like how do you, where's that balance? How, how do you find, figure that out? I mean, yeah, that's totally a great question. Um, I think it comes down to what, you know, the parents goals are right. And, you know, we said, fine, are you like, you know, your baby's fine. Yes. Like we know your baby's growing and everything, but like, are they operating at their highest potential. And that highest potential doesn't mean that they're going to be an Olympian or the best at their sport, but it's going to be that their internal environment is in a balanced, confident state. They trust themselves. They trust their body. They're able to feel their body and have that connection. And when, you know, we have stress in our body, it hinders that communication. And the more stressors we have, the farther away we are from like our highest expression. And, you know, there's different philosophies. Like I, you know, I'm lucky that my partner is also a chiropractor, but even if he wasn't like, I don't think I would ever stop getting adjusted or getting body work. And it doesn't have to just be chiropractic. It can be acupuncture. It can be massage. It can be physio. Like there's always going to be stress and we always want to be our optimal self. So, you know, I'm going to do things to continue to take care of myself so that, you know, I can continue to run and be active throughout my entire life. And, you know, if a patient, a, you know, a baby, a baby's parents come in for breastfeeding support, and I tell them, you know, all these things that we can do to help them throughout their milestones throughout their life. And, you know, they only want breastfeeding support. And after that, they don't keep coming in. That's okay. You know, cause I know that I still did 
a really good job at supporting that baby. And that's going to have long lasting effects. Um, yeah, they're going to fall when they're younger, they're going to hit their head, you know, they're going to have those things. And I mean, they might still come back later on in life. Um, but yeah, everybody just has different goals. And I just work, you know, on supporting everybody at whatever stage that they're at in their life journey. So I, I want to jump forward, I guess, in the life cycle and maybe ask about your personal experience. So you talked about like, you know, being, I'll say chronically injured. You didn't say that. So I'm kind of putting words in your mouth there. Um, no, I was chronically injured. Okay. <laughs> So, 100%. I've um, had like over 10 stress fractures. Yeah. So it's so like, you see what you, kind of what you were alluding to, um, you know, being, so chronic injuries, you know, kind of coming to this like more holistic place. So, you know, I, I guess there are people um, that advertise like, I've never been injured or I, I don't get injured. And sometimes I wonder whether it's genetic um, you know, I've had chronic injuries over the years. When it came to running, triathlon, I seem to be a little bit better off. But when I just run, I seem more prone to injuries. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you about, you know, now that you know a little bit more about, a little bit more as an understatement, but um, okay. more about, you know, the body, movement, preventive measures, all those kind of things. How do you keep yourself operating without running into that history of chronic injury and it, it kind of recurring yeah um well the first is definitely you know nutrition and I definitely don't err on the side of under eating anymore and like you know like I definitely probably like I overeat but like I'm incredibly active and I just really I listen to my body like if my body is craving you know, pizza or mac and cheese or whatever, like I will eat that. Um, but I also, you know, really just work on like eating nutrient dense foods, like organic, um, local grass fed meat, you know, just, I'm just fueling my body and listening to what it's needing. Um, I like, I mean, yeah, I'm still super active and like to the average person, like I, you know, I probably do too much, but I also balance it now with um, like, I knit quite a bit. And so like at, like for my rest time, like I'll watch TV and I knit or like I, I now have a garden and like I do things that keep me grounded and slow me down so that I can still be out in the mountains for seven hours and know that it's okay. So just a balance between my activity and my rest. Um, and then of course, like, like body work and I get adjusted like at least once a week. Uh, my partner is a Cairo and he specializes with, um, like concussions, neural rehab, vestibular stuff. Um, and he's helped a lot. Um, and then I see lots of different chiros. I see chiropractors for like, you know, when like my knee's a little twingy and like, Hey, like I need someone to like do some dry needling on my knee. But I also see, um, chiropractors that kind of support my nervous system and help my body to release, you know, the stored energy and emotions that I'm not great at releasing myself. Um, I see acupuncture. I said physio already. Like I, I, I probably have at least one appointment like once a week or once every other week to just continue to support my body. And I mean, I'm fortunate that like I do trades with people, but I would also pay for it because I think that, you know, I've beat up my body for so long that it needs extra love and support so that I can continue to ask a lot of it for many more years. You, know, you one of the things you said is talking about like listening to your body and I, this is something that like I, I think that we kind of understand but then I also think kind of chronically again I, and when I say these things I always speak about like U.S. culture because I don't know about globally but mm -hmm. <clears throat> like I, I think people just don't really get that like if you take like a, just a cross section of our, our culture as a whole, I don't think it's 
like well understood in, in one of the things I've been working on is like it's often referred to as like intuitive eating. Um, I, I really had this conversation with uh, Sarah Schlichter's episode 78, which is several years ago now. Um, she's a registered dietitian, works with runners specifically um, to try to like figure that out where it's like, yes, you've got a nutrition plan, but you're also like paying attention to, am I hungry? What am I hungry for? Like, those kind of things, those, those cues. And I certainly haven't mastered it by any stretch of the imagination, but since that conversation a couple of years ago, I try to be mindful about like, like, like many people, I love sugar. Like I love sweets, those kind of things. But I do notice that like, maybe I have, you know, a candy bar, a couple of candy bars. And then like, if I'm an adult, I can buy whatever I want. So if I have a whole bag, if I have like, a third or a fourth or a fifth piece and I go like it doesn't it just simply doesn't taste as good as that initial one and it's like my body going like yeah we don't really want that anymore like it, it's still good because it's sugar you still get that like hit kind of but like paying attention to that like more subtle signal that it's like no like it's time like I noticed recently um that like there's just definitely definitely times where it's like I feel like, uh, yeah, I think I need just like a big bowl of vegetables. Like I just need a really like, you know, hearty meal in, in some of it, I guess, at least for me, uh, is simply like new food experience. Cause I didn't, you know, credit to my parents for doing the best they could, but like, I didn't grow up with the colors of the rainbow, I guess I would say. And so it wasn't until college, post-college really that I was try to, to eat a wider variety of things much credit to my wife she's expanded many of the things that I've eaten and I think that come like coming that comes back to like that intuitive eating thing where like if you don't have experience eating a food say you've never eaten kale before like your body doesn't necessarily even know what kale is or to ask for it mm -hmm. so like to me part of that solution of like finding out like listen to your body is like going on this like journey of discovery with totally. new foods first have you uh, i'm sure you've heard of the cookbooks run fast eat slow yeah it's, right uh, it's, i don't know if it's behind me if it's not behind me it's downstairs um but the message that they have for runners is just so empowering and like i recommend those books to so many people because it does introduce different foods different spices different experience around food and how food is meant to nourish us and support us in our activity and food isn't a punishment it's not something we like need to restrict or whatever and it it has just a beautiful message around food and the recipes are amazing. One of the things I think is, this is a little bit of a tangent, I guess, but that, that's kind of what I do. One of the things I think is really great about, I guess I'll say this age, I always say we live in the future, um, is just like the abundance of recipes, the abundance of people that can help you like learn how to cook, learn how to cook new things. You know, I, I think part of the like aversion to vegetables, the like kind of mocking like plant-based diets, those kind of things historically are based on people that don't know how to cook. Like if you cook vegetables poorly, they don't taste great. But if you cook them well, there's many different ways to go about it. They taste good. Like, it, it, yeah. you know, so I- And it comes down to- like spending time and like preparing it too and yeah. intention. And I think that we live in a world that, you know, wants results yesterday. And, right. you know, we have just have such a fast paced life that, yeah, we really need to slow down again and, you know, be appreciative of the food we have and like put time and energy into it so that you know it can support us so that i guess it maybe is a this is a little more pointed question but do you have any like go-to foods you like i i know mm -hmm. we'll get to this here sooner than later but so like i think it was the very first season i used to ask people if you could only live with one recovery food for the rest of your life what do you choose 
So not necessarily that specific <laughs> question, but something like that. Where it's I mean, like, that would be a, a like cheeseburger, a ginormous it's, cheeseburger. It's, it's always... That is what I would pick <laughs> if I could only eat one food. Um, but I mean, like it's more about like the quality of the food, um, where it comes from, how it's grown, um, and, you know, a variety. Like I, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm able to, you know, buy organic food. I also have a garden that we're able to get a lot of our fresh veggies from, but if I'm not there, like I try to buy local stuff. Um, I really try to have like high quality meat, um, where it's local grass fed, you know, not pumped with antibiotics. And it's, it's much more the quality of it. Um, I try to eat, you know, lots of healthy fats. And now that it's becoming fall again, bone broth is like my favorite thing. I make my own bone broth. I put it in like as much stuff as I can, or I just like drink it with a little bit of salt. Um, but really it's just like, just eat lots of different foods and there's gonna be foods that you like, and there's gonna be foods that you don't, and don't eat those ones, eat the ones that bring you joy and feel good eating. And I mean, maybe try to like limit sugar a bit. Right. Like, what, that like? yeah, but I mean, like if you were to eat like a whole package of Sour Patch Kids, like you're not going to feel good after it. And if you do feel good or if you don't feel any change, it's probably that your body's so like run down already that it, you, you just don't feel those changes. And mm. I actually, I wanted to bring up something too. You were talking about, yeah, or like there's something that made me just remember, like, we're just so disconnected with our bodies and, mm -hmm. you know, our bodies, like patients will come in and they'll be like, I threw out my back. I didn't do anything. I was just picking up my shoe or something. And it's like, well, you know, what was happening in the months before, like your body was trying to tell you something, you might not have been able to hear it, but it was trying to. And eventually the, the whisper gets louder and louder until it literally like smacks you on your, on your butt and like allow it forces you to not move. And so I think with like my experience with chiropractic is like, I just have that better connection with my body and in the physical realm and the emotional and like what it needs to be better supported. And I really try to bring that um, message to my prenatal patients and, you know, telling them like, nobody knows you and your baby better than you. And I'm um, trusting that intuition, trusting your body, because if you're wanting to give birth, if you're wanting to try a vaginal birth, especially if it's unmedicated, like you need to feel your body and you need to let your body do what it's meant to do to safely birth you and your baby. But it's when we block things out or when we try to, you know, do and go and not like be <laughs> that you know, that's when we mess with mother nature. Um, Alyssa, as we're running out of time, um, as I mentioned, we we're going to get to this sooner rather than later. Um, the question I'm asking everybody this year, which I'm asking all my guests for the season, um, is how do you celebrate your wins? Whoa, how do I celebrate my wins? Um, Oftentimes it's with a ginormous burger or pizza. <laughs> um, and really just like, for me, it's showing my body gratitude. Um, you know, every season in high school and college, I would have an injury and, you know, never knowing that, like if I would ever be able to run or if I would be able to do big races and last year finishing the Squamish 50, 50, like just like being so grateful for how far my body has come and that it was able to do something so tremendously hard and I survived and I wasn't injured and yeah, just, just being so grateful for where I am right now. Well, so if people want to get in touch, see what you're up to, find that course, any of that kind of stuff, where, where can they do that? 
Yeah, um, so I have a website. It's called Running Wild Cairo, uh, Cairo, C H I R O dot com. Um, and then my Instagram is Dr. Alyssa Salava, S A L A V A. And we'll have links for that stuff down in the description, whether you're on YouTube or if you're on YouTube, we'll also link uh, to cool. Alyssa's YouTube channel. She's got some uh, yoga videos of, or if you're a runner, useful for you there as well as some other stuff. So uh, Alyssa, thanks for hanging out with me. Thank you for having me.